Hello, this is Brian Funk, and thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. I'm very excited to announce that my new book, The Five Minute Music Producer, is now available in paperback form. A real book that you can hold and touch and turn to any page you like in a second. And it's a pretty big book, 629 pages of activities, exercises, and wisdom I've learned over the years. It's available on Amazon.com. Five Minute Music Producer is 365 music making activities that will help with your songwriting and music production. It'll help you fight writer's block, make more music, write better lyrics, develop solid workflows, learn techniques for generating ideas, and finish more music. It's like having your very own music production personal trainer giving you ideas and challenges each day. And the best part is the challenges are quick and easy and they only take a few minutes. So even if you don't have a lot of time, you can spend five minutes and advance your music production skills. There's no better time to improve your music than now. Imagine where you'll be after a year of these activities. The five minute music producer has hit the number one new release in the music songwriting and music recording and sound categories on Amazon. So check out the five minute music producer, 365 music making activities. It's available on amazon.com or you can go to brianfunk.com slash book. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, I have Sarah Bell Reed. And Sarah is a performer, composer, trumpetist, modular synthesist. Synthesist? That's hard to say. <laughs> um, she makes a lot of really wide-ranging music. And one of the descriptions I really enjoyed was that it's graceful, danceful, silk falling through space, and a pit full of centipedes, <laughs> which was describes just how th- it goes from so many different extremes, from more traditional classical sounds all the way to far out, stretching the definition of music with noise and, and a lot of the electronic stuff that goes into it. She's a doctorate of music arts at California Institute of the Arts, teaches music tech and modular synthesis online. I've been watching the Introduction to Modular Synth course, which is cool. Sarah, it's great to have you here. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. You have a very impressive resume of stuff you do, and it's so wide ranging. I think it's really cool that you have this, it's like the nice place music is going, especially music education, where people are starting to take the traditional stuff and bring in some more new stuff, some of the more cutting edge stuff that's happening out there. And it's such a nice thing to see that you're bringing that to your performances, your music, and also your teaching. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you. (laughs) I think for me, you know, I have a very traditional background in my musical training, um, but I always had this feeling, even though I didn't quite know how to describe it or, or what it meant, but I always had this feeling that there was something more that I wanted to be able to explore in my music making. And so when I found and was introduced to these, you know, more experimental aspects of making music like improvisation and just experimental electronics and all of that it really felt like all of the puzzle pieces were coming together it wasn't a replacing of everything i had developed as a traditional or classically trained trumpet player it was just like oh now this story makes sense (laughs) now my Mm -hmm. voice feels more complete you know you know what i mean so like it all came together yeah i found that for myself too just over time yeah. the different things in your life that feel so separate from each other, sometimes they start coming together into this one path and you totally. you need a little time to see that happen. At least I definitely did. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and it, it's nice too, because sometimes the um, music education departments are very steeped in tradition and kind of resist this stuff. They see it as something that they, you know, almost like a challenge to it maybe. Um, I'm not sure, but... I've, I've run into that myself um, occasionally with um, trying to bring in just, I teach high school English as a day job and trying to bring in like music production, Ableton Live stuff yeah. into, um, it, not everyone is interested. Some people in the music departments were really excited and other people were kind of like, that's not music. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> get that like feeling. Do you encounter um, that ever? Uh, some of those different 
challenges and how people see it? Oh, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Uh, both in, you know, in educational spaces and just in the world, you know, with people having different musical experiences, different backgrounds, different perspectives, different things that they like. Sometimes, you know, the music that I that I'm really interested in and that I make is challenging to listen to. You know, sometimes it doesn't have a traditional obvious hook or even a, a repeatable rhythm that you can like snap along to. Like sometimes it's just very um, uh, kind of amorphous and more like sound design. You know, a lot of the time people, some people will say, oh, well, your music is more almost like experimental sound design than it is quote unquote music. To me, in my opinion, it's all music. Like all sound mm -hmm. is is music. But but yeah, people people sometimes express all kinds of opinions and <laughs> and I've definitely uh, I've had some challenging conversations with people who don't get it and don't want to get it, but I've also had some really exciting and deep conversations that are more based in curiosity people who don't get it and are like okay what is happening you know i don't mm -hmm. know what i'm hearing what am i hearing <laughs> can right. you tell me how to begin to listen to this and i love those kinds of conversations you don't have to get it right from the beginning you know what i mean in fact mm -hmm. i feel like that that mentality of you know you have to get it when it comes to music actually can really perpetuate that that siloed um, way of thinking that you can find in some, you know, educational systems, like a, what I believe you were talking about, where it's like, this is classical music, this is jazz, you know, this is pop music. Right. Um, I feel like if it were, if we could give everyone a little more permission to not understand things and have that be okay, we would mm. be able to maybe blend a little bit more freely between all of these different modes of making music. Right. Yeah, that's cool you it's say that. It's just a thought. It's just something I've been thinking about. <laughs> well, I guess you probably get a lot of the, Sarah, you play your trumpet so nice, but these buttons and knobs. <laughs> well, I even get, believe it or not, it depends on the concert and the audience, but I've even had people come up to me afterwards and say, do you, after a long performance on trumpet, be like, well, do you ever play a nice melody on that thing, on that horn, you know? <laughs> um, yes, in fact, I do. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> Um, it's just a mix. It, you know, everyone has different, different backgrounds and perspectives that they're coming from. So, well, art, you know, especially when it's new, always challenges people and it, exactly. it divides people, and, and that's part of what's nice. And I, yeah, and there's people I don't know who it's credited to, but just kind of, um, it's better to have people love it and people hate it than just to have people. Okay, I've heard right? this before. It's have more people of that forget again. about it. Then yeah. I, you know, yeah, yeah. I once had a mentor tell me that early on, and I'm so grateful that they shared that with me because it's really stuck with me. You know, if you have, mm. mo if you move someone with your music, even if you're moving them in a way that maybe feels slightly, you know, negative, or they they don't like it, or they don't get it, you're still stirring something up within them. Mm you're expanding their life in that moment. Your music changed them in some way. It made them question what they, how they think about music. It made them hear new things, right? That's actually incredible. Yeah. Uh, and so from my perspective, I, I, it's not that I gave up, but I, did, I let go of the priority of trying to have everyone like my music many, many years ago. And now I'm focused on sharing really meaningful listening experiences with people as my one of my primary goals in making music. I imagine trumpet came first. Yep, actually, but, well, piano way back and then trumpet yeah. and then electronics, yeah. Uh, how did you get introduced into that electronic world? What was it that, was it like somebody, a friend or? Um, it, um, I, was in, I was in grad school in California, so it was pretty, you know, relatively late. I had been playing trumpeted music for many years at, at that point. But I had never even seen, I had, you know, a synthesizer. I had no idea about this world at all. And um, for some reason, I decided to join a class called Interface Design, which is a class where you actually design and build your own 
musical interfaces or interfaces for musical expression. So it could be something that has buttons and knobs on it, like an Ableton push, you know, something that maybe is a MIDI controller, or it could be, you know, anything you could imagine that you might want to use to control sound. So people were building wearable sensor based things that they would then, you know, give to dancers and the dancers would move around and that would, that would give them data to, you know, you to turn into a, a synthesized sound or to control lighting. Uh, and I really wanted to build a gestural interface to go on my trumpet. That was kind of where it started. So I had never used Ableton. I had never used a synthesizer. I had never even used like an effects pedal. <laughs> but I was like, okay, I want to do this because this sounds really cool. You know, how can I turn my trumpet into some kind of controller for electronics and visual? At the time, I was really interested in like coded visuals and stuff like that. I don't do a ton of that anymore. But so I started there and then... Once that thing was built, I realized you can't make electronic music without understanding how electronic instruments work. <laughs> so then I started to work with modular synths and more in Ableton and different programs on, on my computer to kind of pull it all together. Right, right. So that yeah. pulled you right into that world. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of a strange introduction into the world of electronic music, but I'm grateful for it. It's something that I really was interested in when I first started getting into computer-based music. I started on guitar, playing in rock bands, not trained or anything like you, but more grimy punk rock angle. And once I started finding out about MIDI controllers and mm. that you can put them together and map them how you want, it really made me think about just instrument design in general. Yeah. Just how amazing it is that certain things like a trumpet or like a guitar or a piano have stuck around for so long yeah, and still seem almost like these unsolved puzzles that have so much left to give. And now there's all these new kind of ways of looking at music and it's, it's a really fun time. There's always something new coming yeah. out that's a mm -hmm. totally exciting new way to create music that... Yep. sometimes relies on skills you have already and sometimes it enables people that have no musical training at all to yeah. create really interesting music. And you have, um, can you describe what you did to your trumpet a little bit? Yeah, I I've can. I've seen some pictures and like <laughs> it's, it's kind of, it's like space age almost. <laughs> yeah, um, in, so basically what it is, it's a little collection so basically it's run with a microcontroller an arduino which is a little tiny microcontroller that you can get for you know i think 20 or 30 bucks um and it allows you to attach different sensors to it and read the data from the sensors and uh so i built this little enclosure that goes onto the trumpet and it detects the motion of the valves so the pistons that you use to change to play different notes and also the the amount of pressure that you have that your left hand has on the trumpet as you're holding it hmm. and also the tilt there's an accelerometer in it as well so as you move the horn up and down or, or side to side it will detect that as well so that's basically what the interface is and then that arduino like i said it just reads the data and allows you to to transmit that data onto a computer. And from there, you have to get creative and figure out what you want to do with it. If you want to use it, you know, as MIDI to control a MIDI synth, or if you want to convert it to some other data format, which you can do and send it to another program and so on and so forth. But the real music making starts at the computer end of things. Mm. And the device, which I call MIGSY, which is minimally invasive gesture sensing interface. Remember folks, I did this at, in grad school. It was very much my thesis, so it's super <laughs> nerdy. <laughs> I apologize. Oh, that's cool though. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that part is really just about sensor uh, data capture, like gestural mm. data capture, yeah. Right, and, and you have to then, like you're building the instrument, you're building this thing, and then you have to decide what all of that stuff does which yeah. can change for I'm sure every performance. Exactly. And that's the that's the most challenging and and also the most rewarding part. Um 
I co-designed Migsy with uh, someone named Ryan Gaston, who I was in school with at the time. And we, I remember we got to the point where all of the sensors were working, the data was flowing to the computer, and we were just looked at each other and we're like, what the heck do we do now? <laughs> like, what do you do with seven streams of numbers? How do you turn that into music? Mm -hmm. It's a big challenge. But, um, you know, you just go to go piece by piece and you, you, you can, you, basically you can think, well, maybe this, when this number goes up, that means there's more reverb applied onto this sound. Or maybe when this number goes down, maybe we divide this, this string of numbers into like three sections and we use each section to trigger a different sound. And you start, you just start small like that. And then the ideas start to kind of click as you go. Right. That's yeah. pretty much the same advice I give people um, with Ableton Live and programming yeah. and MIDI controllers. Um, yeah. I do a class for Berkeley Online. It's a sampling with Ableton Live. And there's a live performance portion. And I explain to the class, like, look, I'm not expecting something ready for prime time at you know, Madison Square Garden or something like that. It's just build it small. Start with one little thing you want to do. Right and try that out because it's it's different than picking up any other instrument because you you have to build the instrument and then you have to decide what it does and then you have to make music and and exactly <laughs> and often what i've learned over and over and over again is that simpler is better when it comes to mapping things like midi controllers or anything mm -hmm. in my experience anyway you often think well i have 10 fingers and i've got 34 buttons like let's use them all but and, you know, some people are really great at that kind of thing. For me, I've really realized that less is more, you know, sometimes just three or five really meaningful controls can be more than enough to make an expressive piece of music because, you know, it's mm. not all about like triggering a sound and then that's it. It's triggering a sound. Maybe it's loud this time and softer this time or, you know, different pitches and like all of the different things you can do to the sound once you trigger it. Um, I hope that makes sense. I feel Definitely. like I kind of went on a little, <laughs> but less is more is the, the moral of the story. It's the same thing I've done with my live performance set in Ableton. Um, it's the same set I created almost 15 years ago. Right. And it just gets save as, save as, and you just change something. And it kind of started like slowly, it went up and I added things and then yeah. it kind of got a little overcomplicated. Yep. Where I, well, I have these buttons, I might as yep. well make them do something. Um, and my performances, when I listened back to them, sounded like somebody that was afraid the audience might think I'm only checking my email on my computer. So I'm like <laughs> overcompensating, doing way more. It didn't serve the song or the music, but it looked cool. <laughs> right. You, know? you were busy. You were. You had your hands full. I was full. busy. <laughs> and by now, it's tapered off a lot. It's yeah. nowhere near as complicated as it was at one point. Because, um, yeah, it's just... I, I agree with you a lot. The simple stuff is where it's at, used effectively. Right. That's fun. You've done some really cool stuff recently I wanted to talk to you about. It was one of the big things that got me to reach out to you with the creative, um, the Create with Courage. Mm -hmm. For 30 days or 30, maybe it's 31 days, yeah. you did just a post on Facebook is where I was seeing them. And just offering some wisdom, information, some experiences from your past. Right. What, what inspired you to start doing that? Well, I was thinking a lot about why I make music. It's a big question that I actually ask myself fairly often. I think it's mm. just helpful to, to check in. And, and for the record, I don't think that there's any right or wrong answer for a person to have. I just think it's a nice exercise of self-reflection to be like, why am I doing this? What's meaningful mm. about this to me? Because it will change as we, we grow as artists and go through life, I think. Um, I was thinking a lot about this. And, and for me, a couple of the really big driving forces behind why I am an artist and why I dedicate my life to making music has to do with creating and sharing connections with people through sound, as I mentioned uh, a little earlier on, and also joy. 
It's a really simple mm -hmm. thing, but just being joyful and doing what I love and sharing that with other people. Um, and in the last couple of years, as I've been doing more online teaching, I've also come to really, really value the pursuit of courage and creative courage. And in particular, one of the reasons why I teach is because I want to be able to help people make more music that they absolutely love with joy and courage. I want to help people make the kind of music that they will listen back to and be like, yeah, like, heck yeah. Like I did that thing and that feels like a true expression of myself. And I am so excited to share that with the world. You know, like I went for it. I, I didn't compromise along the way because I was nervous about what someone would think, which is something that I used to do a lot. Um, and I'm sure many people can relate to, you know, I didn't like dim it down for fear that it wouldn't be accepted. I just did my thing loud and proud. And so those were the values. It was this idea of connection, joy, and, and then courage. And I, and I was just sort of chewing on it and thinking it over. And, um, yeah, the, the idea of, uh, walking the walk a little bit and just seeing, okay, well, what would it look like if every day I shared something that required me to be courageous <laughs> right. and, um, myself and to be vulnerable and just, you know, open about what I've learned in life and, and what I've, what I've gone through that's helped me get to where I am today. Maybe that could help people bring a little bit more of that into their lives. And as an added bonus, I can connect with people along the way, you know, through the discussions and the comments and everything on the posts. So yeah. that's sort of how it came up. And, uh, it was an amazing experience. It was 30 days and every single day I shared some kind of lesson, um, you know, or experience that I've had in life that has had, that is somehow related to being a musician or being a creative person. And, you know, going through sometimes very challenging times, sometimes really awesome times and just everything that you learn from it and how you grow with it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There was definitely a lot of vulnerability shared, yes. which I thought was really nice. Um, especially coming from someone with your background, you have a doctorate in music, you right. So like, it's very, it, it's the kind of thing that I think a lot of people would feel like your past, right? Like you've, you've received the credentials, you're playing the festivals, you're doing all these things that it's, it's nice. It's refreshing. It's something yeah. I've gotten doing this podcast as, as yeah. well is that I haven't had anyone tell me it's easy or that, yeah, I just, I just make music, you know, it just <laughs> yeah. comes out of me like anything, masterpiece after mess. <laughs> Nobody says that. And even yeah. people like you would have thought that really had it figured out still have these struggles and vulnerabilities. Well, and I think that's part of, that's another really big reason why I wanted to do this is because usually, it, it sounds like your podcast is an exception to that, which is great, but a lot of the time online, you see the, the perfect finished product, right? You see the album after months or years of work, mm. you see the perfectly curated social media feed, you see everything going super well, and it can be baffling. Like it can be like, what, how are they doing this? What is wrong with me? Why can't I right. get that perfect, you know, schedule in my studio or make that, make a track a week or like whatever you're seeing someone else do. And I think that such a big part of the growth that I've been able to have over the years as a musician has come from being able to see into other people's real lives and and see them working through uh, mindset struggles or insecurities or life being full of surprises or like, hey, I suck at this. And like, I've got to go and practice really hard and like getting to see that happen, like see people mm. just go from really not having that skill to like a month later really having that skill because they put three hours a day in the practice room and made it happen, you know? Um, so I guess what I realized is that a lot of the time online that's missing. You don't see that process based aspect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of get the flashy you finished just get product. The, yeah. yeah. And then it really, and then, you know, it, 
it, it's easy for someone to be like, wow, I'm never going to be there. Like, mm. I, gu I guess I'm not cut out for this. That's the sentence I hate hearing the most is, and it's something I once used to say to myself, you know, oh, I guess, I guess they have something I don't have, like some secret ability. Right. So I kind of some felt gift. like some <laughs> gift, you know, and of course yeah. people have, we all have our own unique little gifts. All of us do. And, <laughs> and anything is learnable and um, figure outable. And it just takes some grit and perseverance and, and courage. And you got to take action and do the thing, you know? Mm. So I really wanted to, to share that with others and, and um, be honest about how I got like to where I am and also what I am in every day still <laughs> very yeah. much. Yeah. That's an important gift really, because um, you know, you mentioned like the joy of it, but this is the very thing that brings so much people, so much frustration and um, yeah. self doubt. And I mean, all the, it's funny, you know, when you, you, you mentioned also like, why do I make music? Like sometimes I get these feelings too. I'm like, what am I making these like silly songs for? I'm like a grown up now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like let's do something important with my time, right? And right. <laughs> I, I, I think about that and when it's not coming together and when it's not working out, then those, then that's when I'm really vulnerable for that kind yeah. of feeling. And, yeah. I, and there's no joy in that. Right. And at least, um, and you said there's no, right or wrong reason, which I think is so true too, because I, I have a lot of friends that just have an acoustic guitar that they strum after work in the backyard. Mm -hmm. It's not to record anything. It's not to write a song. It's maybe learning a riff or just because they like to hear the sound under yeah. their fingers. Yeah. And sometimes we lose that in this like quest to mm -hmm. whatever it is, whether it's to make songs, finish things or, or get our releases out um it it is a real fast way to lose the joy of it and yeah i think with something like music where especially if you're trying to make a career out of it there's there's so many safer bets <laughs> for like careers that if, at least if you're going to do music you should be having fun you should be enjoying it's it because so that's important that's yeah. the reason you would ever be crazy enough to do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so important. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's something over the years that I have lost and found and lost and found again. And what, I, what I've realized for myself is that joy is something I can come back to on purpose. I just have to be aware of it. I have to remember. <laughs> mm. I have to remember to be like, okay, Sarah, how can this be fun it sounds like such a silly question but when you're when you're in the studio and things aren't working and you're like ah this sucks ah, i suck and then all of the stuff comes in all of the thoughts and the oh the damn opens, no one's yeah. gonna listen anyway and blah 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 which i <laughs> call mind mind trash that's what all of that is it's like in that moment it's not easy but the most valuable thing you can do is just be like Whew. okay breaks and then how can i how can I make this fun right now? You know, mm. and maybe the answer is pick up some random instrument that you haven't played in a while, or maybe the the answer is take your battery powered synth out and sit in the backyard, or like whatever it is that just feels fun, and just come back to that joy and that reason why you're doing it. For me, a lot of the time, it's like I'm not going to do this right now. I'm just going to improvise. I'm just going to play because for me, mm. that is fun and. When I start doing that, basically 100% of the time, maybe 90% of the time, it just gets me out of my head. I'm gonna be real. <laughs> and I reconnect to the sound and my breath and my body and my music and something clicks, you know? Hmm. That's a great question to ask. What would this look like if it were fun? How could I make this into something fun? How can this be more fun? Yeah. I also love the question, how could this be easy? That's a little bit of a side note, slightly different question, mm. but that's a bonus power move right there. Cause we are so right. good at overcomplicating things. So mm. I love asking myself that one too. It's like, I've got a big project. I've got to get it done today or this week. How can this be easy? Yeah. <laughs> I had a really funny and silly <laughs> one of those moments just like a week or two ago with this podcast where with the art, 
Um, I finally have somebody helping me do some editing with the podcast. Animus, shout out to him. His, his help has been so great and tremendous. But sometimes I stick in episodes that are just me talking. Mm-hmm. And I was getting really stressed out. I was like, oh, the artwork is going to get all messed up because it's going to say like this number of episode. And then mine's going to come. I'm like, oh, what am I? And I was like, why do I need the number on there? <laughs> How <laughs> can this like, be easy? <laughs> oh, my God. This is a problem I don't need to have. <laughs> but it, it just, it was the kind of feeling that made me like look at everything in my life and be like, what else am I doing this to? <laughs> Where yeah. else am I trying to put oh, numbers where they don't need to right. be? Right. That is some deep wisdom. That's good. (laughs) (laughs) It's a funny example, but it's so true. If you're anything like me, if you hadn't noticed that, you could have agonized over that for like. I did. Oh, I did. Time. Yes, there was like months, (laughs) like two months. (laughs) It was like stressing me out. Oh well, I'm really glad you came to that. That yeah, a simple thing. Yeah, <laughs> but it's such a it's such a good question. It reminds me. I don't know where I heard this because I would love to attribute this to somebody, but um, it was like I don't know. It's like we say like this brings me joy. This brings me joy. This, and then the person just turned around. I was like, no, no, no. You're taking joy in it. Take joy in it. So it it makes that feeling of like having fun and like enjoying mm-hmm. something for what it is more of an action than something that happens to you. Mm-hmm. And that again has been really helpful for me in mm-hmm. certain situations where I'm, I'm thinking like, oh, music isn't bringing me any joy. I was like, well, I have to take joy in it. Uh-huh. What is it about it that makes it fun? I guess it's another way to look at it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's valuable. The, the, I don't, sorry, I don't know if you want to change topics, but one other thing that popped into my mind is just that, um, It gets to be fun. Like you have Mm -hmm. permission, permission granted. Even the most quote unquote serious, professional, legitimate, insert whatever qualifying word you want, musician is allowed to have fun, (laughs) Mm -hmm. right? And like somehow I I feel anyway, maybe I'm just speaking from my own, or I'm certainly speaking from my own experience, but it, it almost felt when I was in school at times, it almost felt like fun was a waste of time. Like fun was not focus fun was Mm. not the discipline that was needed uh fun was goofing around you know it wasn't valued in the same way yeah yeah like you said a minute ago like why am i'm an adult why am i making these funny songs or whatever (laughs) and i just think that um for me realizing and and embracing that when i have more fun i make better music it does Mm -hmm. not mean all my music sounds cartoonish and goofy and like ha 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 some of it does but but that, that's not the end result. It just means that I am more embodied in the process. I'm more present. I'm more joyful. And as a result, everything works better, yeah. right? Because I'm moving in flow with myself. I'm not fighting against myself. Yeah, the play aspect, play music, you know. Play, um, yeah. Play music. It's so important. Yeah. Uh, we were saying we having trouble remembering things on the spur of the moment. And I'm trying to think of a book now. Um, but it was all about improvisation. And mm. it talked a lot about play. Oh, The Art of Is. The Art of Is is what the book is called. I think. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'll write it down. I'll put it in the show notes. But um, it it just struck me like that's where so much fun happens. And when, you're, when you are a kid, suppose you're on like a playground or something, you're just making up rules you're coming up with things on the fly you're not trying to decide if it's acceptable or if it's you know smart enough or intelligent yeah. enough which is something i struggle with a lot with my music i always feel like i'm not being clever enough mm-hmm. <laughs> you're just, not alone <laughs> which spirals me out of yeah. the joy of doing it but that the when I get playful though, then I'll do something weird that I wouldn't normally do. That would be maybe a little unorthodox. That yeah. might sound clever later on, <laughs> right? But it was just because I was kind of being silly or just yeah. letting go of things. Letting go, exactly. You take risks when you when you're in a playful mm. state. You're curious. Curious is the magic word for me personally. Mm. When I'm playful, when I'm having fun, I get curious. I ask myself what if, 
what, not in a bad way, not what if no one likes it, but what, what would happen if I did that? Ooh, what if right. I put those sounds together? Ooh, what if I map my controller in this way? Ooh, what if I do it all backwards? And that curiosity is, in my <laughs> opinion, is where like innovation comes from. It's the people who are like, oh, I wonder if I connect this in this way instead of that way. Oh, look, I just stumbled across this cool new technique that people will use for the next 40 years, you know right. what I mean? <laughs> yeah. um, and so I love that. And for me, that is like the, the magic mindset space. If I can get into a playful, curious space, mm. I, I know I'll, I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it, it's helpful with other people too, especially um, yeah. people you get along with that you're comfortable with sometimes that can help you get there oh a yeah bit. for sure yeah in um watching some of your videos i came across one that i thought was really i mean there were a lot but the one that stuck out to me was when you were playing with some um, mixers to create mm -hmm. feedback so it was like um I forget what you titled it, but um, basically you're plugging the outputs of the mixer back into the inputs and creating yeah. all these feed you, stuff you're not supposed to do. Like you're not allowed to do that, right? <laughs> if you if you went into a studio and started doing that, they'd throw you out. Like, what are you doing? You're gonna break something. It's gonna. But th you were taking that noise, really feedback, and just interesting. Yeah. Well, things people wouldn't think is interesting that would normally think was wrong, but that was something you were using then to create something interesting. Right. And that's, yeah. that's a playful thing. That's the kind of thing you might, if you let a kid that didn't know what they were doing, just start connecting things they would yeah. come up with. But a mm -hmm. trained professional would never think to do that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the technique that you're referring to is called no input mixing. And uh, yeah, exactly. It's a feedback based um, technique where you patch the outputs of a device back into its own inputs. And by doing that, you are creating a feedback loop and it will start to self oscillate, which means it will start to produce its own tones. And they are inherently super chaotic and unpredictable. Mm. And um, Something that's so fascinating about working with feedback is, in my opinion, is that you, because of the chaotic nature of the feedback loop that you've created, you lose direct control over what you're trying to do. So, for example, on a mixer, you know, some, some mixers have the three band EQ, like high, mid, low EQ knobs for example, um, you could turn uh, the mids up and you'd expect the mids to be boosted, but it might actually cause the sound to go from a steady tone to like a choppy sputtery sound. Mm. Or you could turn the volume knob up and instead of it getting louder, the pitch will go down. And you get all of these strange nonlinear interactions because of the way that you have it self-patched. and. I love that. I find it delightful and super intriguing because it, it, it's like an invitation to listen in a really deep way. Again, a really curious way because you mm. don't know what's going to happen. And this instrument, this object that is like usually has a very specific role in your, on your desk, all of a sudden becomes this really lively duo partner. And right. it's like, it's like jamming with you. You know, and you can do this kind of feedback patching with synthesizers too. It's one of my favorite techniques to use on a modular or any kind of synth. It's not just mixers that you can do it with, if anyone's curious. <laughs> so you would just patch those outputs. I mean, like that was a famous thing people did with the, the mini Moog. Yeah. They would put the, I think it was like the headphones back into the external yeah. input. Yeah, the only thing just for anyone who's trying for the first time, <laughs> um, it's just really important that you have your main outputs should should always have a volume control attached right. to them. Don't use Maybe those in the feedback loop. <laughs> and, and I recommend never using headphones if it's your very first time doing feedback-based patching because the volume is very unpredictable. So just yeah. make sure you've got some kind of master volume control. and. I've been doing this now, feedback patching, for you know well over a decade, and I, 
I have not broken anything. And, you know, a signal is a signal and it's all going to be okay inside the, the instrument. Mm -hmm. um, the main thing you have to worry about potentially damaging are your ears and your speakers. So just keep your volume low. Use a limiter. It's a great idea. And um, you'll be fine. Everything will be groovy and you'll make some cool sounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that advice. I've had yeah. that situation where maybe I'm trying to record the band and somewhere along the way I routed something the wrong way and everyone's headphones just start squealing. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> People falling out of their chairs. Oh no. It's, it can yeah. be horrifying and scary when it happens. Oh yeah, when you're not expecting it for sure. But it's that unpredictability. It's almost like a collaborator. That's right. And you know, when you get that kind of stuff. I've, my first exposure to feedback was with electric guitars and turning up yeah. the distortion, putting them in front of the amp. And you, you get these overtones and you can almost get melodies depending on what guitar you have. You get different things screeching out of it. Yeah. And it, it becomes an art in how yeah, to- Yeah, yeah. And it's beautiful. I mean, there's so much music throughout history that, you know, it's a short, relatively short history of electronic music so far, but- so many people exploring feedback in such beautiful ways. And it's not always crazy, you know, blasting noise. Like you said, sometimes it's delicate ghostly tones and mm. little chirps. Like it can be very beautiful and tender even. It's mm. just all about how you kind of dial it in, um, you know, which just comes down to making small movements, turning knobs slowly right. and listening. I've sampled feedback a long time ago off my guitar and I was going to make an instrument out of it you know, inside a sampler in Ableton Live. And I was really surprised at how soft it came out mm. because it's not that way when you're doing <laughs> it live, especially through a guitar amp. Yeah. I, I'm sure you probably have family members that are very understanding of strange noises coming out of oh, wherever yeah. you're working. I, ha I have the same thing and um, my wife is totally cool about me making any kind of noise but a uh, year or two ago I was recording an album and I decided I wanted like all these guitar feedback tracks going on so I had this little amp and just cranked it up and I was just sampling it because I was like I'm, I'm gonna also make a collection of these so I can have yeah. them and that was the one time she came down she's like what are you what what's going on in here <laughs> Because <laughs> to just be squealing and screeching away, she probably thought like That's I so blew funny. up or something. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. My family's put up with a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think anybody that's making music, even if you're just in a traditional thing without experiments, you're, you're looping the same thing over and over and over and over yeah. just to tweak things. So people around you get used to you just incessantly <laughs> it's it's a really nice way to think though with that sound and useful sound for music can kind of just come from anywhere yeah. there, there's really nothing that's off limits after a while when you start thinking in that way totally i'm working on a piece right now and we, I just spent, uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, but I spent the day at an old abandoned uh, sawmill, like a cedar sawmill, sampling um, the big, you know, they had these incredible big saw blades, huge, mm. like six feet wide. And when you hit them, strike them with different things, they just sound incredible. And they ring for like, some of them 15 seconds, like our long decay ring. And, um, just gorgeous. And there was a big stack of old cedar logs that had been that hadn't been cut into boards yet. And they're all different thicknesses and different lengths. And so if you whack them with like a stick, they're like, like different, uh, they're like giant wood blocks, but like low, like base right. wood blocks, and they all have <laughs> different pitches. It's beautiful. And so I've been using all of those types of sounds as like percussion for this piece, hmm. as opposed to using you know, real drums. <laughs> it's all right. just clanging metal from, you know, from the sawmill and pots and pans are my favorite. I mean, your kitchen is the, the ultimate 
sample playground. I'm sure you've told people that a million times, but like open up the cupboards, <laughs> get the pots yeah. and pans. Um, yeah. And the kitchens yeah. usually have a cool reverb to them. <laughs> yeah, maybe they're like, it's not like carpeting usually in kitchens. Right. So they kind of have like this room sound. We, we do an assignment with the Berkeley class where you just go through your day and just find sounds, your normal routine, but like, listen, pay attention. And so many people never get past breakfast, you know, <laughs> because the kitchen is just loaded with appliances oh, yeah. and different pots that. and pans and jugs. It's really <laughs> cool. Mm -hmm. and, and everyone's is different. You would think after a while that everyone's song would sound the same or everyone's just sampling their kitchen, but every that's like what I think is some of the beauty of it too, is that just everyone's atmosphere is unique, especially when you start adding up all the individual pieces. Of course. Maybe we have a pot and pan that sounds similar, but once we start opening cabinets and drawers and th then we get a whole new palette. Yeah. And also how you, you know, what you do to those samples, right? Like, do you mm. use the, the slam of the cabinet door as like a little percussive, hit or do you time stretch it or do you you know speed it up and so it's this like really high little piccolo sound you know that's where it gets really really individualistic um mm -hmm. some people some person might hear a melody in the way that the doors close burp, 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 and make a whole piece about that and someone else might not hear that and instead they might hear like a really awesome uh rhythm and they mm -hmm. might run with that so I think, yeah, music is everywhere. Anything is an instrument. It all comes back to curiosity to me. <laughs> it's just a big loop. It's yeah. a big feedback loop. <laughs> <laughs> Positive feedback loop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you use any particular gear to do this? Um, do you have like some giant rig with furry microphone <laughs> wind honestly it depends if i'm in my so when i can i bring things into my studio just so that i can record um in a more acoustically dampened space uh but often i'm if i'm out and about i'm just using like a simple zoom field recorder nothing fancy mm -hmm. um it does it, there it could certainly be a fancier setup but i I haven't upgraded anything yet and it's actually been years and it's, it works well. Mm. Most important thing to, to get, which I didn't get early on is like a good wind sock of some kind or wind screen. Cause that's the right. one thing that will really rain on your parade when you're trying to record outside is the yeah, of just wind. That low <laughs> rumble of the wind. Yeah, yeah. But other than that, honestly, it's more, in my opinion, it's more important to get the sounds and like be creative with them than it is to get the most perfect Right. High quality, pristine recording. Um, I say the same exact thing. Yeah. You're better off to have it. And you have a I, phone probably. That's what I was you? just about to say is I've even I've even recorded samples on my phone. I don't do that anymore because I have this Zoom recorder, which is great, but that's how I started was just mm. using my computer mic, like the built in mic and my phone and just voice memoing everything. Yeah. And uh it's fine. It's a place to start. I was doing a class um a week ago. Um with Berkeley and I was trying to sample my voice through this microphone, but for whatever reason, my interface wasn't connecting with mm. my computer. So I had those uh, Apple AirPod, not mm -hmm. these ones, but the ones with the wire. So they're old ones when they still had the eighth inch jack. Mm -hmm. So however long ago that was. And I just sampled my voice through it to make an instrument that I could put inside a sampler. And I loved the quality of that cheap mic. In, a, in some ways, I almost like the bad mic better because once you start stretching it, repitching right. it, weird things happen that aren't in the clean recording yeah. that you can get. <laughs> totally. Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's all important just... important to yeah. just get it. Exactly. It's just get it, Make start making things. You can always upgrade like, your gear later if you want to, but start making stuff now. And you never know, like you're, to your point, you might end up liking it even better. You're not the first person I've heard who, say, who says that. It's like, hmm. there's just some kind of magical quality about that, you know, kind of 
quote unquote crappy quality, <laughs> you know, bad recording. It's like actually yeah. got some life to it, you know. I find sometimes in the context of a recording, that quality helps the sound kind of stick out mm -hmm. where it doesn't get lost in all the other really nice recordings. It's got its own little texture, its own little yeah. space in the mix yeah. that you can really dial in. Yeah. So you've got a course um, that's about to start up, you said, um, yeah. learning sound and synthesis. That's right. So that sounds like fun after we've been talking a little bit <laughs> with some of <laughs> yeah. your philosophies in there, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is, it's a, so it's, next round is starting in late August. Um, and it opens every year, twice a year. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, as the name suggests, learning sound and synthesis. It's a class that's all about sound design and making music with modular synths and, um, you know, that could be to do sound design for video games, or you could, you know, take the class to make your own music, your own electronic music, dance music, experimental music. A lot of folks are in the class with a focus on film scoring. Um, basically, what I teach is a very, very comprehensive how to and synthesis technique uh, course that focuses on universal synthesis concepts rather than specific instruments, because I'm really interested in giving people, you know, the technique and the knowledge that they need to use any instrument they want, whether it's a, a virtual synth that runs on their computer or the synth inside of Ableton or some Moog desktop synth or a keyboard synth or whatever. And I don't want to you know, lock people out of the class by saying, sorry, if you don't have this one particular Euro rack, you can't come and learn. So um, I teach using VCV rack, which is a really amazing free modular synth uh, program that runs on your computer. And I really, really love it. And um, yeah, we start there and people go a million directions <laughs> mm. from, <clears throat> excuse me, from, from there. Well, that's yeah. cool because so much of it is based off these building blocks. Exactly. And that's something I didn't know when I first tried to play a synthesizer. I didn't understand that there were these commonalities between yeah. all of them. They all looked like different spaceships to me. Yeah. And I felt like I had to learn every single one, but soon you start to see the pieces and how they that's, come together. Exactly. That's the thing that all of my students say, and it's so exciting when they get to that point. Um, you know, usually a month or a month and a half into the class, people start saying, oh, wow, like I, I just realized how this instrument that I've had over here collecting dust on my desk works. Like I get it now because, you know, we, we basically, the, the philosophy behind the class is, is kind of like the under the hood approach to learning synthesis. So instead of learning how the, the um, you know, the Moog matriarch works or how any of those instruments work on the top level, you're learning how each individual component works like hmm. really deeply what's up with oscillators, not just, yeah, we know they drone, but like, did you know that you can, you know, use oscillators for 50, hundred different things and then they can be chaotic and noisy and, and drony and all of this. And like, what's up with LFOs and how can we use, as them as sound sources and how can we use them as control sources and all of that. So by the time you go through that, you not only know how VCV rack works and how modular synths work, but you go back to your various other instruments that you have and it all starts to click because mm -hmm. you're like, wait a second, I get it. All that is, it's, right. it's, a, it's an oscillator, it's an LFO. I know how those things work. That's a filter and you're able to, you know, make more music with them than you than you were able to before which is really exciting hmm yeah you just start to see the you start to see all the connections yeah. yeah yeah right um do you have a favorite synthesizer i mean Ooh. i could i would say you probably yeah. go modular stuff but yeah uh, i am a big fan of modular and in particular i mean the reason why i love modular is because of the flexibility um I also love, you know, I have a hydrosynth, which is a keyboard-based polysynth. I love it. Mm. Um, 
But the reason why I love it is because of all of the flexibility that I learned on my modular that I can bring into how I patch it and how I customize right. <laughs> the sounds gotcha. on the hydrosynth because it's very flexible. Um, these days, what I've been really enjoying are very small modular synths. Um, I, you know, very limited. I've put together, I don't know the exact size, but just a tiny little case, two rows, fits in a backpack. Um, and I'm just living with it as though it is a fixed mm -hmm. signal path synth, or not fixed signal path, but like those are the modules. They're not swappable. Those are the components. Yeah, right, and you, right. you do, of course, make your own <laughs> patches within them, but I'm not changing them out every couple of weeks, which is something that some folks do a lot of in the yeah. modular world. And I really enjoyed that because it feels more like my, my trumpet or like a keyboard where it's an instrument that I can really get to know on a really mm. deep level that's not constantly changing. And I like the smallness of it because it forces me to be really creative and limitations, you know, hmm. are my, my best friend in, in the studio is just reduce the limitations. Again, less is more. And um, I find that by, you know, giving yourself fewer options, you have to make better creative yeah. decisions and you try things that you probably wouldn't try else uh, otherwise. Yeah, I think that is what creativity is. It's yeah. making do with what you have. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. You're in this box, you know, not the, necessarily the module, but yeah, that's the trouble with modular synths, though, is that you can you can <laughs> always grab another one, right? So right. I always try to encourage people to keep it small and just see what you can get get out of that, because there's always something you haven't tried before, guaranteed. Yeah. <laughs> I don't feel particularly creative when I'm scrolling through 9,000 kick drum samples trying to find the one I'm going to use in my song. And I can imagine what modular it's, I, I've not gone too far down that road, mostly out of fear <laughs> of, of getting carried away. Um, uh, yeah. Because I've been in front of walls of them. Yeah. yeah and yeah. it kind of like, ugh, what? And, and then to just know that you can always get a new one and swap it out. It's, I don't know. I think I'd I'd go bankrupt real fast. Yeah, that's why. I mean, in like, yeah, I totally hear you, and you're not alone. <laughs> um, but that is a big reason why, like, the class that I teach and the community around it, the learning sound synthesis community, is it's re we're really focused on like making music first mm. and foremost. It's not so much about the gear. Of course, the gear is a big part of the discussion because we're learning how it all works and and people need advice on what, how to put their systems together. But music is always the number one goal. And I think that that really helps. Um, for one, it, it feels more inclusive. It feels more welcoming. It's like you don't need the big sprawling synth in order to make awesome music with modular synths. You can open up your phone and get like a modular synth app. And like, that's fantastic. Start with mm -hmm. that. It's perfect. VCV racks free. I love it. It sounds really great. There's actually a ton of VCV rack modules that are direct emulations of digital modules that you can get in Euro rack format. And they, they run the same code and they right. sound fantastic. So it's a perfect place to start. And for many people, it's not just a starting point. It's the, the perfect setup for them, you know, for years. I use VCV rack all the time, especially when I'm on the road. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to travel with like a massive, you know, rig. <laughs> yeah, that's a big consideration when you're playing out and touring, especially. Yeah. Um, like, what are you carrying around with you? Um, I know for myself, like a lot of times I'm going alone too. Yeah. And if I'm going into like New York City and Brooklyn, I want to be able to carry everything in one trip. Yeah. Because I'm lucky if I park a half a mile away from the club. And I don't want to leave half my gear in the club no. and half in the car. No. <laughs> so I've made it, that, that's been a really helpful limitation for me. That, like what can I fit on this table and what can I carry? Yeah. Because for a little while I was getting interested in, it was, wasn't modular, but it was, it was modular-esque with MIDI controllers. Cause you're kind of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah lots of pieces. You got all your little pieces together. So you keep adding to that. Next thing you know, like you're out of control real fast. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, I'm sure. So I'm, I'm guessing having that kind of limited space is practical as well as great for creativity. Yeah, exactly. I honestly think it's a, a win-win. I mean, it, it, some of the best shows I've ever played have been the ones that I've been forced to really, really re rethink things because mm. I'm like, okay, I'm flying. It, it needs to fit in the overhead. I also have a trumpet, so I'm really limited, right? It's like my trumpet case has to come on the plane. So then I'm like, what can I slide into that carry-on, <laughs> yeah. you know? or into my backpack or something like that. Um, but again, it just, it, it, yeah, gets you thinking in a creative way. It gets you looking for sound everywhere in a more resourceful way, mm -hmm. you know? And um, I've found it really liberating. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I've gone to, to almost no guitar pedals, you know, just really a tuner and a, a little bit of a noise gate. And it, it's just so nice. I used to rely on the delay pedal and the reverb and all these other things to make my parts interesting. But taking that away forces you to really pay attention to what you're playing right. and the music much more than pressing buttons. <laughs> we like pressing buttons too, though. It's okay. It's fun. <laughs> there, it is. It's, there's nothing like it. But it... <laughs> It's such a slippery slope. I think for myself, um, I avoid the like pain of trying to create by adding gear and then complicating things. You know, uh, maybe pain is not the right word, but like kind of like the fear of, yeah. like, I don't know if I'm going to make anything good. <laughs> so if I can kind of just fiddle with stuff, Right. I'm a little off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that for sure. Um, you can make something great, though. <laughs> I will yeah, try. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So where can people sign up for the course? You also have a free one we should mention, too. That, oh, yeah. That was really cool. I've been watching a little bit of that. You have great energy, too. I think that's a nice, you know reason why people should come to you is that you're you're excited about it you're and you transmit that really well over the videos of just <laughs> hey this is really cool everyone you should check it out <laughs> yeah well i teach because i am genuinely passionate about teaching and about this topic like hmm. i i am all fully in <laughs> and in love with what i with what i teach and um so yeah, I'm happy to hear that that comes through. Um, yeah, I really do what I, I do it because I love it. Um, I'm, I'm also really passionate about helping people get started in electronic music and not only get started, but, but go deep into electronic music and make awesome music um, who, who for whatever reason feel like they're not cut out for it. Like that's a big kind of personal mission. If you, mm. for whatever reason, just feel like you're not smart enough or you feel like, you know, oh, I'm not, I'm the least techie person in the room. Like I've heard that so many times. Um, or they've got it and I don't have it. Or like, you're just, maybe you believe in yourself, but you're just intimidated, super normal, super common. And modular synthesis is an intimidating thing to get into because there are a million options and it can just be daunting, right? Like, where do yeah. I start? What do I need first? So I, but I, but at the same time, it's so fun and so creatively rewarding when you are in it and you're making the kind of music that you're dreaming of making. So my goal is just to kind of help bridge that gap for people and help bring people together so that they can have a community, right? Uh, I mentioned one of the reasons why I make music is that connection aspect. Um, it's a huge aspect of the course as well. Uh, we have, in my opinion, one of the most vibrant and like supportive and deeply insanely creative communities on the internet, all focused on modular synthesis and making music with synths. Um, a lot of courses have the, uh, you know, 
lifetime access. Like you can come back and, you know, once you're in, you're in. And that's how this class works too. But what makes it really special and it gets better every single cohort is that the alumni are in there. The alumni right. from cohort number one, which was years nice. ago, they are there and they are like offering feedback and they're sharing their new releases and they're collaborating with one another. And everyone comes to open mics and we do hangouts and we do live Zoom calls. And like, it's just such a vibe, <laughs> like mm. such a good vibe. Um, I know that I'm obviously biased because it's the community that I've been building, but it just like fills my heart with so much so much happiness. So you asked how people can sign up. Um, I will tell you that. <laughs> uh, the easiest way is just soundandsynthesis.com. Hmm. Soundandsynthesis.com. Cool. That That's for the main course. The free course is got a slightly longer URL that maybe we could drop in the show notes. Yeah, I'll put them all in there as well. Yeah. yeah. And the free course is great for people who maybe aren't sure if this modular synthesis is something that you want to do, but you're curious. Um, it's a completely free class. You use VCV Rack, which is free to download too, so you don't need to buy anything. And it walks you through what modular synthesis is about, how it works, how to make your first couple of patches. Um, and the whole thing takes less than a couple of hours. So good thing to do yeah. on a weekend. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Um, the community is so huge. Those are the best semesters I have at Berkeley when people are interacting. Yeah. When um, I have a Discord when we get that going and people are moving. But what I love about what you just said is it's really cool that the people from the first cohort, all the cohorts are still there. Yeah. That's that's one thing I would at Berkeley, it's just whoever's there at the moment. Yeah. And it's a big deal. It's such a you know, it's something that I started on day one, this kind of open door, like once you're in the LSS community, you're in. And I was mm. hoping it would work this way, but I wasn't sure. Because you can't obviously yeah. you can't force people to come back around, but they really do. And the other reason why it's valuable is because it allows it allows people to really go at their own pace and take some of the urgency and the pressure off of like you, you know, needing to get mm -hmm. it all done right now, which is such right. a big part of life as a musician. You've talked about this already. There's so much pressure, so much urgency, like, especially in school, right? You have one semester sure. and if you don't learn it all, then, you know, too bad. But this, whole class is really designed so that there is a cohort like you do go through with a group but at the same time it's okay if you don't get it all in four months because you have access to it you know continually into the future and you can go back through the next round and lots of people do that and what i've found just from an education point of view what i found is that when people can relax a little bit they get deeper into it, you know, and they'll they'll go through the first two or three chapters, they'll get inspired, and then they'll say, you know what, I'm gonna make an album. Even though I mm. still don't know what uh, sequencers are or how they work, I haven't gotten there yet, I'm so inspired with what I have right now, I'm gonna compose for three months. That's great, like, yeah. that's fantastic. And then they get to a point where they think, okay, I've done that, I'm full, now I wanna go learn about sequencers or now I'm ready for MIDI or whatever they're ready for in their next step. And the class is there and they go back in, do their next chunk, you know, mm. rinse and repeat. That's great. Cause that's yeah. one of the biggest problems with education, yeah. honestly, is that it's so make believe a lot of times and you're not doing real work. You're doing like work for your teacher and you don't get to do the thing you want to do until you do the yeah. thing you have to do. Right. But why are you learning modular since probably you want to make music so if you music. get inspired along the way make it make it do I it know. there's <laughs> like a, a there's great. a funny like a kind of a meme that some of my students <laughs> made of every almost after every video certainly at the end of every module i have this little thing that i say that turned into an accidental catchphrase where i'm like okay now go and put all of this into action in your own practice and like make music with it and try it out <laughs> And if you need anything, I'm here to help, you know, and uh, I'm wishing you happy patching adventures ahead. And I basically say it after every video, <laughs> just because I so earnestly believe that the best way to like learn this stuff is to do it, you know, mm -hmm. learn the concepts, yeah. learn the theory, and then make your own music with it. 
and that will reveal to you the gap in your knowledge or the gap in your setup, right? If we link it back to the beginning of the conversation when you were talking about mapping your MIDI controller, if you start with one thing and you do that, it will reveal to you what's needed. You'll be like, yeah. oh, that's cool, but I'd really be great if I could do that too. Mm -hmm. There's your next step, easy. Take, then you take that next step and you just build from there. Like you don't need to have it all figured out before you start making music. Oh, that was the big revelation for me with playing live using a computer was I'll just, I'll just play and then I'll decide, oh, I wish I had a filter here. Okay, yeah, let's yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. And then I'll play more and then I'll say, oh, <laughs> what if I could do that? And yeah. it builds naturally because I think at first I was trying to plan it out too much. Yeah, that's normal. And it just never happened. Yeah. But it's all stuff that you're never going to master really anyway. There's a lifelong learning pursuits synthesis like if we if we're lucky that that's what i hope right <laughs> i hope that i will always be you know learning new things every time i pick up my instruments discovering new things every time i sit down at my synth that's my my dream <laughs> mm. i don't ever want to get to a point where i'm like cool i know it all i know that's never yeah. going to happen <laughs> I saw Keith Richards talking about his guitar once, and he's been playing his guitar for hundreds of years now, I think. And he says, it's a puzzle, man. And he's like, every time I pick it up, I find a new piece. Yeah, I and love it was, that. I, it was just so cool to see how he's still, you know, enamored with the mystery of it and learning new things. And, and you see how that, like, that personality or that approach is so open to receiving the new pieces, right? Oh, it's mm. a puzzle. Every time I pick it up, I learn a new piece. Like that is so powerful. As opposed to something that's like, oh man, it's so hard. Like I should, I should know it all by now, right? Mm. Which is like, why don't I know it all by now? I've been playing for 200 years <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> right? It's like, do you see that? It's the same oh, yeah. situation, but the one is like, every time I pick this up, I get something new out of it. Mm -hmm. That's like a state of like, bring it on, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's a mindset to, thing. It's a mindset thing for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's same problem or same. Same uh, circumstance. <laughs> yeah. Same circumstance, completely different kind of yeah. approach. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that having that sort of like, I can learn any, I can keep learning forever is really a great way to approach it. Cause otherwise yeah either either you get frustrated that you haven't learned it all yet or you get closed-minded in thinking that you did and right and you stop learning and right. probably lose interest yeah 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 the beginner's mind mm -hmm. there's a that's a book uh let's see if i can remember shenru suzuki i think is the name but it's called zen mind beginner's mind good read okay small short quick read but a lot of words it's like, something right? that I bring into the beginning first day of any class that I ever teach is this idea of the beginner's mind and I'm going to paraphrase loosely because I can't remember the exact text but the idea is in the in the beginner's mind possibilities are endless but in the expert's mind they are very few and it's mm. just what you said right it's like coming into things with this perspective of always learning. Oh, I don't know that yet, but I can't wait to learn. Every time I pick up my instrument, I discover something new. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is really a gift if you just change the thinking that well, this thing has another surprise around the corner yeah. as opposed to, oh no, I don't know all <laughs> the surprises yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what's coming next? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, totally. That's good stuff. I, I think um, that's a really great message to be giving people because especially as we get older, we are less and less comfortable being beginners and new at things. And we don't do as many new things in our lives as we get older compared to when we're kids and you'll try anything. Yeah. It's such a good thing to have. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, joining a class, like the reason why I bring this into all of my classes is because signing up for a class takes courage it's not easy to mm. do that to be like hey i don't know this or i'm gonna be the least 
a skillful person in the room on purpose. <laughs> like I'm going to do yeah. that to myself. Like that takes courage, especially yeah. when it's when we're out of school and maybe have been out of school for decades and you're electing to go back and learn something. Like all of my classes obviously are are not in uh, university settings anymore. They're they're online. So there's people of all ages. Some folks have been out of formal learning environments for 50 years. And it's an amazing thing what happens when you put all those people into the same space. Uh, you know, this person's like, oh, I'm so new to this, but I have 40 years of experience with this. And this person's like, oh, I'm never seen this before, but I'm really great at this. And then you get mm. those people talking and you know, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would gather from talking to you that you also do quite a lot of learning in these classes as well. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I always say that teaching is my favorite way to learn. And I, I, I say the same thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I learned so much from, from everybody. You know, we, we, like I said, we have zoom calls, open uh, coaching calls basically where we listen to each other's music and, and give feedback and we talk about ideas that go way beyond the technical aspect of synthesis, but are more about being a musician. And, you know, we get into sometimes mindset related topics like what you and I have been talking about that have to do with performance anxiety or time management or like just being a creative person. Hmm. I always learn from everyone because, you know, I have my experience from my own practice and from my past students that I can offer, but when there's, you know, dozens and dozens and collectively hundreds of people in a space all sharing their perspectives, it's impossible mm. to not learn <laughs> from them as well. Well, so. it's possible if you take that, I'm the teacher here well, and this is my <laughs> class, like, that'll shut it down real fast. That would shut it down. But f for me, I, I find it really enriching. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I'm very happy to hear that for you and for your students. Yeah, yeah, it's a fun time. We have, we have fun. <laughs> yeah, good, right? We're playing music. <laughs> we are playing music. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Um, we'll definitely put all that stuff in the show notes. Is there anything else you want to mention, um, bring up, or tie uh, together <laughs> before we go? <laughs> I don't. No, Patch I don't. together. Patched together. Say. I don't think so. Very nice. Well, <laughs> I thank you for taking the time to talk and share all that with us. Really awesome work you're doing. I, I find it really inspiring too. Just um, I've learned a lot and um, that energy is always really nice to tap into. So I know I can get that enthusiasm from you in one of your videos. So thank you for that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's my pleasure. And honestly, I, you know, thank you. Thanks to you for saying that and to everyone, everyone listening, everyone who who tunes into the videos that I share and, and sends messages and stuff, because those kind words that I receive in various forms make it so even more exciting and rewarding to keep doing what I'm doing. So I really appreciate all the little nuggets that come in. Thank you for sending them in. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you. And we'll say thank you to everyone that listened. Have a great day. Bye for now. <laughs>